Hey, 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 this is Joel and a uh, you know, quick episode of Duffed Unscripted. Yeah, I saw this paper in PNAS and uh, I find it really fascinating and it relates to a blog post that I wrote a few years back. And so I thought I'd just hop on here and show you this paper and just give you a quick rundown of a few figures and tell you what's interesting about it. A submerged Stone Age hunting architecture from the Western Baltic Sea. That's right, they found a hunting structure made of stones from the Stone Age uh, in the Western Baltic Sea, so underneath the ocean. Uh, divers, actually it's not even divers, they were just doing scans of the bottom of the, uh, of the sea and found something that didn't seem natural, right? Seemed designed, right? See, there was a, a, a line of, of what, what turned out to be a line of stones for which in this paper, they go through a bunch of hypotheses. They try to come up with every possible natural hypothesis for the origin of this line of stones that they can come up with. Like, how could uh, these stones have lined themselves up this way? And they pretty much eliminate every possible natural way it could happen and come to the conclusion they were purposely put into these positions. But of course, these are rocks that are found, oh, some, what, 21 meters below the water surface, today's water surface. So that's more than 50 feet down. Um, very, very large boulders placed in kind of an even distribution of one to another. Over, what, they say, 1,673 original uh, individual stones that they've identified so far, covering a distance of 971 meters. Uh, and I should have said this is Jacob Gearson uh, and a whole bunch of different colleagues uh, out of the University of Michigan, or at least the main author out of the, the University of Michigan. And uh, which is interesting because the other one I'm going to talk about is in is in Lake Huron, which is next to Michigan. And that's where another ancient hunting um, structure has been found below or on the bottom of Lake Huron. But let's look at this one that's in the Baltic Sea. So first thing you're wondering is, hmm, how does a, um, a row of stones get constructed 50 meters underwater during the Stone Age, thousands of years ago? And the simple solution is, the simple answer is, is that the sea level has not always been the same. You know, the sea level changes. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. And one time, actually multiple times, it has gone down a lot has been due to when there's a lot of ice, you know, on the continents of the earth. So like this thing called an ice age, right? You get, you get, you get all the water, the moisture lifting up out of the ocean, being deposited on land, freezing there, the ocean level goes down. And the oceans have dropped upwards of over 400 feet at different points in history. Uh, and so that has left these types of places dry at one time uh, to the point where there was forest and bogs and all kinds of, I mean, habitats for people and animals to live in. And the idea here is that there was a line of stones um, that was created uh, in order to entice certain game. Now, this is, they don't have direct evidence of this, but this is uh, uh, what other hunting structures are known for and by hunting structure we're saying like these lines of stone sometimes there's like two lines of stone they start out wide and they kind of narrow and then there's sometimes sort of a an oval end to them and that's basically the killing zone right you're sort of forcing all these different animals to to congregate into a known location where you then can hunt them down that's the proposal here yeah, let's just get right to uh, the images here. So where are we talking about uh, in the Baltic Sea? Um, we're up here. This, this map's a little hard to orient to yourself on. Uh, you've got Germany, Denmark, and Sweden here. Uh, and what they're doing, of course, is they're highlighting the ocean, right? The sea, not the land. And so the gray area represents land, and the rest of this is sea. And then they're showing you sort of the depth of the water. The Baltic Ocean's very, very shallow. In fact, during the height of the most recent past age, ice age, not all of this land would have been um, not under sea level. All right, it would have been above sea level. Not that there wouldn't have been lakes, right? Because there's basins here, so there would have been uh, lakes collected in places. 
And so this, this portion right here is an extension of it. Whoops, I better scroll up here a little farther. So if we go down to the, just this little spit right here uh, next to Germany, uh, we have this bay here today. And that's where the blinker wall is. And that's what they're calling this thing, uh, the blinker wall. There's, a, there's this line of stones along here. Uh, and I do want to note that there's a whole bunch of other dots on this figure. And those dots represent features that have been found underwater of past uh, habitats, right? Or past locations where people have lived, right? Where there's stone tools found or other uh, evidences of, of, you know, habitations uh, found underneath what is today the ocean. Uh, and you'll see that most of the, the dots are right around where the, 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 the edge of the ocean is today. So they're in shallow seas. And, but as you go out into deeper and deeper waters, well, it would be farther and farther back in time because the sea level has been rising, right? Over the last thousands of years, forcing people who once lived all the way out in the middle to have to move back to where the land is today. And so this blinker wall is actually quite deep, suggesting it's quite old, uh, meaning it goes all the way back to much closer to the last ice age. So I'm just going to scroll down here. These are the um, multi-beam bathymetry, uh, or this. I don't, actually, this figure is side scan images, and this line right here is what stuck out. Right, you got this interesting feature that's on the bottom of this uh, shallow sea, and you know what what is this you know an earthquake line or i mean it could be a fracture point or something you know, just on first inspection on that but then as they look closer they find that it's a it's a basically a rock you can think of it as a, it's a rock wall there's a rock wall there and sure there's things like glaciers that have been in this area during the ice age and glaciers can move around rocks and actually glaciers can push rocks and so, but this line extends for a long period of time and it's a very thin line of rocks. It's just individual rocks next to each other. That doesn't seem like something that anything that is a natural process, this seems to be from the mind of a creator, right? <laughs> the creator being human beings who had this idea to actually pick up rocks and put them in these particular locations. So let me go show you what this looks like on side scan. Um, uh, well, this is an echo sound. So you're looking uh, down through the sea, right? So up here, this would be a sea level at the top. Uh, and then we're going down, here's 21 meters. And then some parts of this are down to 24 meters. But here at 21 meters, the blinker wall is right here. It's actually on a kind of a ridge. Um, and on the... On this ridge, then there is this area where there is a uh, there was probably a a shallow uh, lake here, um, and all these are you see these layers here. That's like they've done sediment cores through there, so they know these is layers and layers and layers and layers of sediment. And then down at the bottom of these layers of sediment, right down here, is a um, a considerable amount of peat material, so bog material. And there's spruce trees. All right. So this is like an Arctic tundra sort of like type of habitat that is found below a several meters of sediments. And so the idea here is that actually you'd have the blinker wall here. And then at the time that that was there, it's possible this was already covered up. So this might have been a long time ago during the more of the height of the ice age. You would have had a tundra-like environment down here. Then as um, the thawing of the ice age, then you had water fill up this area. You had a lake here, and the lake is then getting sediments from drainage from other areas, bringing in sediments. And then you have gradual layering of sediments. So all these layers have to be post last ice age. Um, but the point is that at the time the blinker wall is here, maybe there was a lake here. And their idea is that there was a lake there and then there's a wall there. And then there's sort of a, you know, a, a, a narrow area. And this is kind of like there's a, a long ridge. And then you have, mm, I don't know if I can do this where you can see it. There's a, there's a, a ridge, mm, sorry, a ridge. And then there's a long area of, of what, basically lakeshore. 
And so they, it appears they may have built a wall away from the lake shore. And then as caribou and other, you know, large maybe ungulates are traversing from maybe sort of towards Sweden or up in Denmark down toward Germany, maybe on a sort of a trek, a semi-annual trek, right? Uh, during the different seasons, they would have been sort of forced along this wall in a rather small area, allowing for hunting parties to be able to be more successful. So then if I scroll down here, let's just look down here a little bit further. Then they're comparing this as they, this, the rest of this paper is, all right, hunting hypothesis. After That's only after they talk about all these other possible ways, right? Natural processes for the origin of blinker wall. So in the discussion, they give a whole bunch of hypotheses. Here's things people have suggested to explain this. Because we weren't looking out, we weren't out looking for this. We were simply doing some scans, looking for whatever we're gonna find. I can't remember why, actually, I don't think they mentioned this paper exactly why they were doing this originally. But they came across this interesting signature, and then, you know, hey, if you're if you're a scientist and you're curious, you want an explanation for observations you make of this world. And they come up with a bunch of hypotheses. They basically knock them all down and they say, look, there's other places in the world uh, where there are stone walls. And these stone walls have been interpreted in multiple other places in the world as being tip usually some kind of hunting structure, right? Some kind of like, as they call it here, a drive lane. <laughs> You're driving game in a direction that you want them to go. Uh, and one of these in particular is Drop 45 drive lane in the United States, and that's the one in Lake Huron, which is also found below sea level, and so therefore is a more post-ice age, but very early on post-ice age location, because when those seas were also lower, because Lake Huron and all the Great Lakes were much, much lower at one time as well. Yeah, let me just read a, a, a little section of the end here to give you a flavor for sort of some of their conclusions. For a long time, the dating of the megastructure was problematic. But in the meantime, it has been possible to prove that the individual structures are of prehistoric age due to the comparable environmental conditions of the late glacial early Holocene transition stone wall drive lanes that were used for reindeer hunting of a particular relevance for the interpretation of blinker wall. The submerged Drop 45 site located in the ridge in Lake Huron, United States, shares several characteristics with this particular place. A location near the top of the slope, but below the crest. A sub-parallel trending marsh lake shore on one side. So there's a, there's a lake shore and there is a, a sort of a slope, a hill, and then you put a wall up there. The construction is on bedrock. They didn't just, these aren't placed on um, mud flats or something like that. For one thing, they needed to have a source of stone that was nearby because these are large stones and difficult to transport. Uh, and so they basically used stones where they were. And that's what, that's why being on a, on the top of a slope is important where they're going to be exposed, where the stones are probably more exposed. And then good preservation of submerged context, 20 to 30 water depth, right? These types of hunting drives are found more often submerged because they're protected. <laughs> Who's going to go go get those stones and move them around once the uh, the sea level rises and covers them up? Whereas any hunting drive that's from Paleolithic, you know, Stone Age type stuff in the past, and there's a pile of stones that somebody has placed and made a made a wall, and you're not using it as a hunting lane. You're going to pick up those stones and carry them off and build your own little shack out of them, right? And so those things disappear. We, we're, you know, probably many, many, many different Stone Age construction sites are completely gone on the surface of the earth where people live because we just recycle material. And so this is why looking underneath the sea is a rather unique opportunity. There are all kinds of places around uh, the world on the continental shelves. Uh, and in lakes, uh, systems that are connected to oceans or shallow seas, where we have found uh, evidence of um, past habitation by humans. And that's a rather undisturbed site. I mean, there's some interesting ones off of Florida where we have uh, Indian and Native American settlements um, that are completely inundated. 
uh, and we have sort of, uh, you can see the arrangement of the settlement there because of that inundation and uh, preservation uh, as a result. So let me, let me just leave this and let's go to my blog post on Lake Huron. I'll just show you that real quick. Yes, here I am on my, uh, my blog, Naturalis Historia. And I wrote this, uh, I think, 2017 or 18 or something like that. Man-made hunting structure discovered under Lake Huron. A North American Doggerland. Uh, now, Doggerland actually relates to what we were, where we just were. The North Sea between uh, England and France. Uh, that area is uh, at one time thought to be a, you know, a, a, a habitable area. Uh, not under a sea and just like the Baltic area. So this this whole area basically north of Germany, um, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Germany, France, and England were all connected with no sea in between. And there's abundant evidence that there was uh, many and good habitats um, for people to have lived at that particular time. And we've dredged up lots and lots of different bones and things like that. Very few uh, evidences of actual human remains and settlements, but we have certainly found, well, this would be one case of it, uh, but we've certainly found all kinds of Ice Age animals uh, remains in those particular locations. And then tons of plant evidence, right? Tons of evidence of bogs and trees and forests and right um, that are preserved underneath the seas, underneath those seas. So I have here, this is Lake Huron. Um, and this is under 120 feet of water. So this is rather deep, way down under Lake Huron. There is these types of stones there. All right, they got lots of algal growth and all kinds of stuff on them now, but here's some divers examining boulders at the bottom of Lake Huron. And they believe that this was a caribou drive, all right, for pre prehistoric hunters. There's actually two rows in this case of these boulders. Um, and I know they don't look that dramatic here, uh, but there's been a lot of sediment also laid down. And so they also have scans of this area showing these boulders go a little bit farther down than they look here. Uh, at this time. And then this is underlain also by sort of an alpine environment uh, in terms of the plants uh, that are preserved in these sediments. But if you look at a picture of Lake Huron, let me bring that up a little bit bigger. Yeah. All right. So here is the bathymetry of Lake Huron. And what's interesting about Huron is that there is this little um, ridge right here, which has been given this name I can't pronounce. Uh, and that ridge, which is today 120 feet below the surface of Lake Huron's waters, is still much higher than the very deep basin that's to the north. There's a more shallow basin to the south. So the idea is that uh, in the past, the configuration of the Great Lakes was actually a little bit different, and the outlet to the Great Lakes was in a different location. Um, the Earth has actually risen uh, since the time of the ice age uh, that's called isostatic rebound or uh, from actually the weight of the ice being released has actually caused the land to lift up higher uh, but there were these very deep basins um, that uh, had formed and so initially after the after the ice age it's thought that you had a you probably would have had a lake over here and you would have had a lake over here Right, but you had this ridge across here, and that ridge was above the lake level, right? As witnessed by the fact that there is like an alpine forest, you know, and bogs and, and, and wetlands all along across here preserved on this ridge. And so this ridge then represented a way to get across, you know, this area over here to Michigan, it wasn't Michigan at the time, but uh, and Wisconsin. And it's thought that animals would have tracked back and forth. So this is, you know, maybe caribou that are living up here are traversing south, right, during the wintertime in order to get to warmer climates uh, in Michigan. And so as they passed through here, I mean, the easiest way to get south would be to cross over this ridge. And so this ridge is, it's still wide enough that, you know, that uh, a hunting party would have trouble tracking down a caribou, a group of caribou that's passing through here because it's, you know, my, many miles wide. 
and but there are constrictions in some areas and they constricted it even more by building right these large um, walls uh, made with large boulders and in this case the 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 uh, it's kind of a v shape and i can't remember which way the v is i can't remember if it's like heading down to michigan or heading up to wisconsin uh, but they obviously could have used it in both directions in some ways. And at the end of it, then there are actually boulders in a sort of semicircle, a little bit of a semicircle there. So it's possible that that also was kind of a constriction to cause the animals not to be able to run through there uh, quite as quickly and therefore providing more opportunities to, you know, throw their spears at them and stuff. So my blog, I talk about, I'll put a link to my blog down in the, in the notes for this but i go on and on about sort of uh, some of the details here but we really were thinking about is the timeline you know how long this would take and of course you know with my interest i'm also interested in relating this to young earth creationism because they have a different view of the history of the world you know all this has to have happened within 4500 years and what's fascinating about finding human sites of habitation uh in places that are over 100 feet below the current level of water uh, really constricts the timeline a lot, especially since the lakes appear to have had the same sort of level that they're at that we would see today for a very long period of time, thousands of years. Um, you know, here's this image of Florida showing that at one time, you know, the Ice Age shoreline was way out here. So Florida was a huge, I mean, double the width currently of Florida. And the six meter shoreline, right? Just just six meters, you know, some less than 20 feet uh, was much larger than it is today as well. Um, and that, that allowed for uh, many people to, you know, if you're living on the shoreline, you know, sometime after the ice age, you were living out here. And so as the ocean levels rose, which they rose relatively quickly back then. Now when I say relatively quickly, you know, it's like inches a year, whereas today it's rising by millimeters um, per year. Um, and of course, what I do is I, I relate this to the concept of young earth creationism, where young earth creationists believe that there was a flood just 4,350 years ago that covered the whole world. And therefore people are concentrated in the Middle East, starting out there. In fact, the Tower of Babel is like at least a hundred years later. And they would also insist that all people, all, right, all descendants of Noah were gathered together at uh, the Tower of Babel. And from there, they then dispersed across the whole world. All right, so at a minimum, you know, if people are going to get to my first story here, we were looking up in the Baltic, they're going to have to go to Europe. They're going to have to get to Europe and they're going to have to go up there near Denmark and they're going to have to build that 1700 foot long wall as a hunting, you know, device potentially. And they're going to have to do that like immediately after the ice age. And when the young earth creationists, they believe that there was a, an ice age, a single ice age. And that ice age was just, what, 100, 150 years after the flood, maybe 200 years after the flood. So about 4,000 years ago. Um, but then that ice age only lasted for a couple hundred years and then like melted really, really, really fast. So that means if you went to the Tower of Babel and that's 100 years after the, that's already in the middle of the ice age, then you got to hoof it, right? You better start running because you got to run away. You know, you're separated at the Tower of Babel. You leave the Tower of Babel in presumably in the plains of uh, Mesopotamia. And you got to make a beeline up there to Northern Europe in order for you to live in a location that is free of a sea because of the Ice Age, except the Ice Age is coming to an end, which means that water is rising fast around the world. And you got to build that entire structure, right? And, and to build that structure, you have to know that it's worth building, which means you probably have to have lived there for many years in order to see the, the, um, uh, the, the migrations of animals to recognize like, this is a worthwhile place to put this, right? That takes a little bit of time to, to generate that knowledge. And then it might take some time to actually build that wall. And then unfortunately for them in the young earth creationist uh, you know, scheme, 
they couldn't have used it very long, right? Because the water surely would have risen and covered everything up and they would have been running away back to higher ground in order to survive. Okay, so that that's kind of a stretch, you know, in terms of like explaining that type of history that you have to really crunch your timeline way down in order to, to get uh, people from Babel to there to do all the things they need to do in order to be um, to be swamped out. But now imagine you're going to Lake Huron. You got to go from Babel, you got to go all the way up through Asia, you got to go across the land bridge. And the land bridge only exists for a short period of time in the young earth creationist model because that land, the Bering Strait between um, Asia and, uh, well, yeah, Northern Asia uh, and uh, Alaska, that you can only walk across there for a very short period of time during the Ice Age. But you had to get there after Babel. And so you begin, you'd have to get, you know, get out of Babel and you just got to go, you got to walk thousands of miles to get to that land bridge so that you can get across the land bridge. But then you got to go all the way down to Michigan, right? To Wisconsin. And you got to get there while you just have those two lakes there and you still have the land bridge across there, right? That ridge. Um, because that's not going to exist there very long because the ice age is coming to an end and it's going to get flooded as well. And then you have to somehow have identified that this land bridge is going to have yearly migrations and you're, it's going to be worth your while to build this structure there. That's even more of a stretch. And then, of course, some people had to go all the way down to Florida, right? And then they had to live way off the coast of Florida, the current coast of Florida, and they had to live there very soon after the Ice Age as well. All of this is really quite, uh, you know, just say you know, people left. People were motivated to move around the world, that's for sure, right after Babel, apparently. Uh, even though everywhere they went, there weren't any people to be seen. And so that meant, you know, traveling for thousands of miles and not, you know, I, you know, I, I say, yeah, if I'm passing through, you know, the coast of Oregon, and there's some really nice places there, you know, it's like, why would I be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go a couple thousand more miles. I mean, you're already not seeing anybody else. You're not running into anybody else. There's plenty of food. Um, that's what's always got me. It's like, you know, why did people make it uh, just just never stop? Because you have to propose that they just never stopped running in order to get to some of these locations in time in order for them to lose those locations as actual suitable habitat um, because of the end of the Ice Age. Anyway, if you want to read more about that in my thoughts on uh, the difficulties that these types of really fascinating locations of, you know, occupied sites that are now submerged, right? They're drowned. <laughs> um, then, you know, you can check out my blog. I'll, again, like I said, I'll put a link there. All right. That's, uh, that's enough. Cool sites, really cool stuff. And I just, I was just excited to see that in PNAS that um, they found another very similar site here in Europe than there is in the Americas uh, in a similar sort of ice agey uh, type habitat. Showing that there is a, a, a similar technology in different parts of the world around the same time. Uh, and in conventional age, they're talking, both of these sites are kind of a similar age, you know, somewhere between maybe nine and 13,000 years old. Okay, well, that's it for me. Uh, thanks for hanging out. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>